I had a dream last night, and uh, I don't often share my dreams. What? Oh, yes, I am. I don't often share my dreams because uh, they are not spiritual. So. But I had a dream that we were in a different facility. I, don't, I couldn't say it's Woodland Park, but it was a large facility, and there were lots more students, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students, and I had a new job. And my job was walking through the halls looking to make sure everybody had on shoes. <laughs> So that's, that's a lot easier. <laughs> All right. That's about as deep as my dreams get, really. Okay, we're in discipleship evangelism. We're going to skip a couple of lessons. I'm not even sure what their titles were. I think one's on the kingdom, and I'll be doing that in Ministry of Jesus here very, very soon, so we won't reteach that. So we're going to go to lessons eight and nine, if you have your book. Lessons eight and nine, the proper use of God's law. And then also the next lesson, not under the law, but under grace. All right, so let's go to 1 Timothy 1, 8. First Timothy 1, 8. And what we want to do this morning is understand how the, the law can be useful to us in certain situations. I know we... We almost rail against the law quite a bit because we are preaching the grace message. But there is a use for the law. And that's what I want to try and, and make apparent to you this morning. So 1 Timothy 1.8 says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Well, how could the law be good? Well, in Romans it says the law is spiritual. There is an appropriate use for the law. And there are times when it is a good thing to have a grasp of the law. And I'm not necessarily meaning all 613, but we'll probably speak more about the, the Ten Commandments, this, the aspect of the Ten Commandments. What possible good use could it have? Well, let's, let's think about mankind and the state of mankind, speaking of fallen man, and the issues that fallen man have. And once we understand man's fallen condition, then I think we can bring in the idea of how we can use the law in a, in a proper way. So go with me, if you will, to Romans 1. And as you're going there, let me just review quickly for you that, and I'm sure all of you now have this pretty well understood, but man was created in the image of God, given dominion over the earth, had relationship, communion with God, and then sinned. And sin fundamentally transformed man from a faith love creature into a fearful, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that, a fearful creature, a fear, fearful person. Uh, spirit of fear replaced the spirit of faith. Distance replaced communion. Ignorance replaced knowledge, lost the knowledge of God. The lights went out, so to speak. And in that condition, the human race has been existing uh, until Jesus came for thousands of years in complete darkness, cut off, with only Israel having glimpses of and having times of communication with God and a certain relationship with God based on the law, but not based on being of the same nature. They were of a different nature. And so God was communicating with them, but there was not communion with him because of their spiritual condition. So we get to Romans, and we're going to go into chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Now let me just take a rabbit trail real quick here. For some who think the wrath of God is a current, ongoing thing, uh, just turn to chapter 2, verse 5. Chapter 2, verse 5. It says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against or in waiting for the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So the wrath of God is, in, is being withheld at this point, but there is a day of wrath. We are in the age of grace. We are in the acceptable year of the Lord. Today is the day of salvation and all of those wonderful verses that we have. So going back to Romans 1.18, let me start over. 
It says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, there's some key phrases in here that we want to keep in mind. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. So there is access to truth. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. Now, whether you see this or not, this is saying that men, even in their fallen condition, have a divine understanding, however limited that may be, they know there is a creator and they are responsible to him somehow. That is where religion comes from. Fallen men know there is a God. They don't know who he is. As Paul preached in Acts 17 uh, to the people on Mars Hill, he noticed there are many idols and the one to the unknown God. People know there is a God. They may deny it. They may claim they are atheists. And what they've done is hardened their hearts or seared their conscience to the point that they, they're, they're comfortable with that. But in their innermost being, they had a knowledge of God, but they hold that truth in unrighteousness. They've chosen unrighteousness over truth. Okay, verse 19 again. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So all men on this earth are without excuse. They can see the divinity of God. They may not understand the plan of redemption. That's something that we have been commissioned to preach but the fact that God exists, that God is a creator, that God is good, those things can be seen in creation. All right, so they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Anyone known someone like this? That they know there is a God but they rejoice or they approve unrighteousness, the works of darkness, over the works of light. And so they, their vain imagination, they, they debate within themselves to the place where they become comfortable with the idea that I can do my own thing. And that darkens the heart. And then it leads to the consequences that, that, are, that are mentioned here. So it says, their foolish heart was dark. In verse 22, professing themselves to be wise... They became fools. A lot of these people are on TV. <laughs> and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made into, into an image made like to corruptible men and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Boy, we could just stop here and talk about current social things in our country. Uh, animals are more revered than babies. You know, it's just men have become foolish because they have chosen to ignore the knowledge of God that is available to them. They are without excuse, but they have chosen to go a different path. Wherefore, God also, verse 24, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. So they're not pre-programmed toward this. This is their own free will, the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, I'm not going to keep reading all of these things, but you can do that in your own time. All of the, the disgusting, horrible things that men in this condition will do. But the point and the question, let me go back to the question, how can we use the law in a good way? That's where we're going with this, so don't lose sight of that. But I'm trying to paint the picture of man's condition. And though they are without excuse and have a knowledge of God, something innate within every human. In fact, if, again, if you go to Acts 17, not, that's not part of my notes, but when Paul is preaching, he says, God has created from one bloodline every nation on earth. And, and dot, 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 to seek the Lord. That's why men are on this earth, to seek the Lord. That is their purpose. And so that is why they are without excuse. He has made himself known through creation. And yet they have chosen darkness over light. They have preferred their foolish imaginations and they have preferred to worship the creature more than the creator. So then we go on down to verses uh, 28. We'll skip some and go to 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, 
God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Who made the first move here? They did. They did not want to retain God in their knowledge. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, so they still know, even though they will lie to you to your face, there is no God, there is no judgment, but they know in their heart there is. In fact, when, when earthquakes come, or when bombs start falling, they call out to God. And they hope maybe he really does exist. Because their eternity there is very, very close to them. People, in fact, I had a good friend, a Cambodian pastor that we worked with for so many years. He was ministering to two Cambodian ladies in San Francisco, and this is way back, I think, during the World Series when there was a major earthquake in San Francisco during the World Series, if anybody remembers that. And uh, he was witnessing to them, and they were putting up resistance, and the earthquake happened at that very moment. And they immediately converted to Jesus. Because people can be swelled up and full of pride and very sure of themselves until they're at that next step, which is eternity. And then they want to cover their bases. They know there is a God. All right, so even though they, uh, verse 32 again, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure. This is where they get their satisfaction, is that there is safety in numbers. Well, everybody's doing it, so it must be all right. Everybody is, is, is willing to do this new thing or this thing that used to be bad. Think of the, the transition in our society from those of you that can go back this far from 40 or 50 years ago to where we are today. Things that were obviously bad then are now accepted and even embraced in our culture. Things continue to go from bad to worse. So this is the, the issue that we have is that men are in darkness and have chosen darkness. Go to Genesis 6, 5. Genesis 6, 5, and then we'll go back to Romans here. And just to give you a context, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. We are very much living in that kind of a world right now. And I don't know if every country is like that, but our country seems to lead the way in ungodliness in many things. And it's a sad situation. So that, that is the, the environment that they're dealing with. Well, let's go to Romans 2 then. And we'll again see how man is responsible Romans 2, and we're going to read 12 through 15. Romans 2, 12 says, For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law, and as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Now I don't have time to fully develop all this. Perhaps Lawson has or Andrew has. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. But we know no one can do the law. That's a different, different scripture. So verse 14, this is what I want to get to. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, listen to this, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Now wait a minute, I thought men were spiritually so-called dead and that they had the nature of the evil one, of Satan, and, the, and we have fallen nature and all of this. Even that, now think of this. When men ate, or when Adam and Eve ate of the tree, what was the name of the tree? The knowledge of? Good and evil. So even fallen men have the capacity to recognize and choose good over evil. That's where fallen men live. Continually making choices of good and evil. This says, 
when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature, well, that fallen nature includes the capacity to choose good. Not many choose good, but they at least recognize it. But some of your greatest sinners are some of your most, most philanthropic charitable givers. They have the double lifestyle. They are able to recognize good and evil and choose both and make themselves look good by doing great works of charity while at the same time living an ungodly lifestyle. Everyone has this capacity. So the Gentiles can do by nature the things in the law. What could this be talking about? Can someone who is not born again choose to not covet his neighbor's wife? Yeah. Can he choose to honor his parents? Yeah. Can he choose to not steal or to lie or to kill? See, by nature, even though he's fallen, I'm not saying he's saved, he's fallen, but he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he can, by nature, choose to do the things he's not even aware exist in the law, has no knowledge of the law, but he's choosing to do good things. Not, he can't do all good things because he's still by nature a sinner and sin is going to manifest in one way or another, but he can make some choices. All right, so let's go on to verse 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Now this is Andrew's teaching here that I really like. He believes the conscience was birthed when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, that's the fruit of the tree. That's your conscience. And so it says the conscience is what is judging their actions. And what happens is people's conscience, choosing darkness long enough, their conscience becomes seared. Choosing evil long enough, their conscience becomes hardened, and they no longer accuse or excuse themselves. They just simply excuse themselves for anything they do. But listen to this, next verse, 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ... So even those without the law, remember from chapter 1, they're without excuse. They know that there is a God. They have chosen darkness over light. But by nature, they could still do good. They have a conscience, and so even though without the law, they they have no that, that relationship of covenant or anything of that nature, still they are without excuse, and they will be judged according to their conscience, of how their conscience guided them through life. So, again, the question that we're eventually going to answer here is how we can use the law in a good way. But we need to understand how fallen man is dealing with his own fallenness. And what his condition is, what his darkness is, what his choices are, how the fact he has not been pre-programmed to be that way. He is choosing darkness over light. And some choose light and by nature choose the, the things of the law without even knowing there is a law. So is everybody kind of tracking with me here? Yes. All right. Let's go on to uh, 1 Timothy 4. First Timothy 4, 1 through 2. So we've, we've introduced the concept of conscience. So now it says in 1 Timothy 4, Now the Spirit, it's, uh, excuse me, now the Spirit, it speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The conscience in some people has become seared. Well, who can we, I'm not going to be politically correct here, so if you throw up your hands and run out of the room, I'll know why. But, uh, People with a seared conscience would be the entire homosexual movement. And not wanting to offend or hurt anyone's feelings, but the, the abortion movement. And if, if you've had one and God's forgiveness and love and all of that, I'm not, but, but the movement, the Planned Parenthood movement to aggressively promote the killing of unborn children, that's a seared conscience. The homosexual movement of things that were once considered perverse, and we use words like queer. Now that you can't, are not even allowed to say that. It's no longer queer, now it's normal. I'm queer for thinking someone's queer. Because we're in this whole politically correct thing of 
the conscience being seared, where actually we think this is openness and love and peace and joy. No, it isn't. It's a seared conscience. We're knowing the wrath of God. We still take pleasure in those that go against God as a society. And so now the homosexual agenda is front and center in the military and everywhere else. And we are to embrace this. And if you say anything against it, then you're the one with the problem. When actually you're the one that your conscience is still somewhat alive and everyone else is just seared. This is, this is the state of mankind. This is what, especially in our nation right now, this is, these are the kinds of things we are dealing with. Let's go to Isaiah 5. Isaiah 5, 20 and 21. It says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. You could tack this on to Romans 1, same thing. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. And that's the, the age in which we live now. And so now we are being forced to accept the concept of homosexual marriage, which I don't know if I've brought this up before, but totally denigrates the woman. She just now has become an interchangeable part. It doesn't matter what sex she is because there's nothing unique about a man and a woman versus a man and a man. Uh, People have not thought these things through because their conscience is seared. And so the the special uniqueness of the woman as the representative, as the bride of Christ in this marriage, that no longer exists because it doesn't have to be a woman now. It can be anything. This is where, and and what's, what's tragic is that even in the church, we've been bombarded now for so long with this that we're even lowering our own defenses, saying, well, I guess nobody's really getting hurt. When in reality, the whole society is on its way to hell. And there's much destruction and much hurt from this, but we've believed a lie. This is the state of, of our nation, the state of our society in many places around the world. And there may be some places even worse than ours. I don't know. Let's go to Ephesians 4. I am going to get to the good news here in a minute. Let's go to Ephesians 4, 18 and 19. And we'll start in 17 to get a running start here. It says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened. This is where it begins. Your understanding is darkened. Compare with Romans 1, what we read earlier. Choosing vain imaginations. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance. Ignorance alienates you from the life of God that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, remember in Romans it talked about without natural affection, parents killing their own children. What on earth is that about? How can that happen? This is explaining how that happens. Past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Parents that abuse their children are the ultimate of selfishness. Because their, children has become, their child has become something that impedes them from partying or doing whatever they want to do. Rather than understanding their God-given role to raise up a child in the way he should go, it's just become a distraction. And that, that goes to various links with some people, the, the, the things they do against their children. The ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. So I've painted a bleak picture here. But this is what, there are people like this with whom you will have contact. There are some people that are ripe fruit waiting to fall from the tree. You just have to say, Jesus loves you, and they're saved. They they just are, they're ready to go. Their hearts are, they're seeking the Lord. They're doing what it says in Acts 17. They're on this earth to seek the Lord, and they've tried different things. My wife was one of these people. She tried Transcendental meditation, and she tried, I forget the different religions. She was seeking truth. Not everybody is seeking truth. 
Some people are completely hardened. Their conscience is seared. Their hearts are hard. They're even antagonistic toward God. And yet, even, even in their case, God hasn't given up hope. And that's where we can bring in the law. We don't use the law as a standard for righteousness necessarily once we are born again. But what we can use the law for is to expose to them, these hardened, seared people, expose to them their need and the fact that they have failed and that there is a redemptive plan for them in Christ. But the, what, the law, what we use the law for in certain cases is to try to awaken the conscience once again. The conscience has become hardened, seared, cut off, whatever, by choice. And what the law can do is bring... Now, let's go to Exodus 20. What the law can do is help these people see their tremendous need, and then you lead them into the message of grace. All right, let's go to Exodus 20. And here we have what we know as the Ten Commandments. And God spake all these words, saying, verse 1... Now verse 2, I am the Lord thy God, which has brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Some people have graven images. You will go into some homes where that is their, their thing. In some cases, that's almost a good thing because it shows some search there is some spark of search in them. They have they've filled it with idolatry, but at least there's a place to start. And so that's where you use the law to say, look, did you, did you know this? That God says you are to make no graven images. Now how they respond, you know, you can't ever calculate that. But that's, what the, that's where the law can be used lawfully. To reveal to people their failure, their need, the fact that they have failed the righteous standard of God. And then as they realize that, you bring them into the message of grace. Uh, Verse 5, you shall not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, am God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, the third and fourth generation, to them that hate me, showing mercy. And then verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And you can then say, have you ever taken God's name in vain? Now, this has deeper meaning than just using his name with the word damn on the end of it. It's it's deeper than that, but that would be a place to start. Have you ever done that? And a lot of people will have to say, well, yes, I have. Well, then you've broken one of God's commandments. And so you're using this law to awaken their conscience and to hopefully bring them to a place of realizing they need a Savior. Uh, Number eight, remember the Sabbath day. Do you ever take time? You don't have to make it a Sabbath day. I teach this in second year, but do you ever have a time where you're devoted to seeking God and hearing from him. No, I don't. Well, God said you're to remember that. Uh, Verse 12, honor thy father and thy mother. Have you ever disobeyed? Ever? Have you ever said something ugly to your mother or your father? Well, then you've broken God's standard of righteousness. You need help. You've broken that standard of righteousness. You shall not kill. Did you know Jesus said you shall not even hate? Have you ever hated And you can bring Jesus' words into this. Uh, You shall not commit adultery. Jesus said you shouldn't even lust. Have you ever lusted? You've broken God's standard of righteousness. Do you see where I'm going with this? And you go through this list of of the Ten Commandments, and you can bring Jesus in when you want. But the point is, can you awaken their conscience which has been seared? And that is what the law is for in, in these kinds of cases. Now, you take them to James 2. Verse 10. James 2 verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So if they're feeling smug and saying, Well, yeah, I'm pretty good about this. I do most of this. Well, have you broken even one? Well, yeah, I'm sure at some point. Well, then you're guilty of all. Or as one guy says, yeah, my wife and I keep the Ten Commandments. I keep six, she keeps four. <laughs> that doesn't work. So if you've broken one, you're guilty of all.
Now you, get, you begin to roll into the good news. Let's go to Mark 2.17. Mark 2, 17, when Jesus heard it, he said unto them, they that are whole have no need of a physician. So make that now relevant to the conversation with this hardened person. All right, if you're perfect, if you have no issues with God, then you don't need Jesus. But listen to this, but they that are sick, I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And now you can begin to say, you've admitted you've broken one of God's standards of righteousness. If you've broken one, you're guilty of all. Hopefully you've awakened their conscience. And now if they're still there with you, you can take them into the the message of grace. So let's go to Romans 3.20. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's all you're using it for, just to reveal sin. You don't put forth the law as a standard that they must keep. You put forth the law to reveal they have failed God's standard of righteousness, and there is no way they can keep the law. So therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Do you agree that you've broken God's standard of righteousness at some point in your life? Yes, I agree. Okay. Then you are in the same boat with everybody else. You need a savior. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law. Major verse right there. The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned. So good that you agreed that you've broken one of God's laws. Good that you have agreed, because you know what? If you had not said that, you would be a liar. All have sinned, and that would have broken one. So all have, sinned and come to, uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, now we begin to enter into this message of grace, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. So without putting them under legalism, hopefully all you've done is use the law to quicken the conscience to realize they have failed God's standard of righteousness in even one point, at one point, all points, same thing. And then then say, did you know you can't even keep, no one can keep the law. That's not what God's asking of you to keep the law. The law just gives you the knowledge of sin. He now has paid that price for you and is bringing you a message of reconciliation. Then you enter into the message of grace. So let's go to uh, Romans 4, 5. And we'll see how this works. Romans 4, 5 says, but to him that works not, but believes on him. See, the question will be, what do I have to do? Well, you don't have to do something other than believe. Him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly. Are you ungodly? Well, according to what we've talked about this morning, yes, I'm ungodly. I've I've broken God's standard of righteousness. Well, he justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Your faith, you can believe yourself into righteousness right now. In spite of the fact that you failed God, we've all failed God, all have sinned. Put yourself in the same boat. You're trying to minister to someone to lift them up. The law has been used lawfully to awaken the conscience, to reveal sin. And then you show them we're all in the same boat. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And now he is justifying us freely through faith. All you have to do is believe. That's all I have to do. I don't have to... I don't have to do some special thing. How many are familiar with the singer Cat Stevens who, from the 70s who now is a Muslim? I heard an interview with him, and he was raised Greek Orthodox. He's actually Greek. And in the, of course, the Greek Orthodox Church is extremely ritualistic and, and what have you. Uh, and he was asked when he converted to, to Islam, didn't you understand the message of the gospel? Didn't you understand that Jesus came and died for our sins and faith in him? 
He says, yeah, I understand that, but I just can't believe that I can't, I, there's nothing I have to add to this. I just can't believe, I can't accept that, that it's just a gift. See, that was, that was the mindset there. I have to add something to this. And you will run into people who will say, what must I do? How, how, how can I rectify my unrighteousness? What, should I go to church every Sunday? Should I begin to do this? Should I begin to do that? Do I need to help orphans? What do I need to do? And that's usually the, the next biggest hump. Once you've gotten them to recognize sin, then the next hump in the road is the fact that they, need, they feel like they need to do something to rectify that. And, and the faith issue is one of the hardest issues for people to, to grasp, that this is a gift. This is a gift of righteousness. Romans 5.17 says it's the gift of righteousness. And all you have to do is believe it to receive it. So it's talking about Abraham here, and it says his faith was counted for righteousness. Let's go to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and hopefully these scriptures are all familiar to you. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But I feel like I have to do something. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is recognize your need and believe that God has provided for your need. And give them my definition of grace if you want. Grace is God's provision for man's every need. Provision has been made for your failure. Provision has been made for your, your, your spiritual need. Provision has been made to, to wipe away the darkness of your life, the seared conscience, the hardened heart. Provision has been made to quicken you and make you a new creation. Provision has been made to renew your mind. Provision has been made to equip you with fruit and gifts. Provision has been made to, to give you abundant joy and peace. Provision is there for every need that you have if you'll just believe. I don't know if any, how many people have had the gospel explained to them in this much detail. It wasn't explained to me like this. But if you can do a good job at the beginning with these kinds of people, roots will go down. They will have something firm to stand on. Rather than just saying, every eye bow, every, eye, what, every head bowed, every eye closed, slip up that hand, I see that hand. You know, okay, praise God for that. But I don't know how much root's being established. Some of you have been there, done that. Okay. <laughs> All right, moving right along. Let's go to Romans 5.17. Romans 5.17. I just mentioned this verse a second ago. For if by one man's offense, so you, here you can even pass the blame if you have to. It's not your fault. It's Adam's fault. If by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive, there's the faith issue, abundance of grace, there's the provision issue, and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. The gift of righteousness. So now you're in this message of grace that it's not about what you do to rectify the past. It's about believing what Jesus has done to rectify your past and give you a future. And all you have to do is believe. Let's go to Titus 3, verses 4 and 7. Titus 3, is this helping anybody this morning? Titus 3, 4 through 7, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, there you keep hammering that home, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, not by your works, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And you can sum that all up in one quick phrase. I posted this once on my Facebook. God is kinder than you think. I love that. God is kinder than you think. What is your image of God? Everybody has an image of God. 
Some, some think he's just a nebulous, can't quite picture that. Some think he's an old man with a beard. Some think he's whatever. I see a young, vibrant, joyful God dancing over me, rejoicing over me with joy. I see a God that's so in love with me. He's not this old cranky guy. You know, he's kinder than you think. Look at this. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's like you were in the mud. You had mud on you. You had mud in you. You were a mess in your hair, in your ears, in your nose. You were filthy. And God loved you so much that he reached down and picked you up and put you in a Holy Ghost bath and washed you inside and out and cleaned you up because he loves you. It's his mercy that he has shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior being justified by his grace. So if the person, you know, if you're ministering to someone and you've taken them through this process, and again, this is a specific group of people that have become seared and hardened. So like I say, some people are just fruit ready to be picked. They're there. But some of these people are just antagonistic. They're cynical. They're hard. They're intellectual. They've got their defenses built up. And it may, you may be the first one to sow this. And the seed may take five years. Don't give up just because somebody rejects you. Get used to rejection. They rejected Jesus. But, but know that if you've planted a seed, maybe five years down the road, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years down the road, that seed might break through and, and, and begin to produce fruit. So don't, don't fear rejection. Some people are ready, some people aren't. But if you can quicken their conscience with the use of the law, using it lawfully, and show them if you've broken any, you've broken them all. You're guilty. You've failed God's standard of righteousness. You're just like me. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I have good news. It's not what you can do to get yourself right with God. It's what God did to get you right with him through Jesus. He's giving you a gift. Do you want the gift? Do you want the gift of righteousness? Well, what do I have to do? All you have to do is receive the gift. You just have to believe. And, if, and, and many people can come to the Lord this way if someone would just take the time to explain it to them. Just take the time to explain it to them. Let's look at one more. Let's go to Romans 2.4. Romans 2.4. It says, or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. See, the law won't lead people to repentance. The law will awaken the conscience, but it's the goodness message that leads to repentance. And once people begin to understand the love of God and have a glimpse of the love of God, and that, that, that's a revelation that takes some people, some of you here still probably are dealing with that revelation of the love of God. Sometimes it takes a while to, to break through all of the stuff that we have in the way. But it's the love of God that leads you to repentance. And when you get a revelation of God's love, that is the biggest root you could possibly have. I'm, when I talk about the root, I'm talking about the parable of the sower and some seed has no root and quickly withers away. But if you have that root of the revelation of the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God, and he's kinder than you think, how much he loves you, that he's washed you with the, the Holy Spirit, the regeneration, that's what leads you into a life of, of abundant joy, of peace, of, of happiness, of fulfilling your purpose and finding your destiny. That all has to begin with that, that root of understanding God's love. And once you've got that, then you're on your way. If you can minister these things to people, See, I've just spent, you know, less than an hour sharing these things. Of course, in a conversation, it may take a little bit longer. But if you're armed with these scriptures and armed with these concepts, you can be extremely effective in bringing people from darkness to light. They just need to hear it. See, so many times we turn people off, think, well, there's no hope there. They just haven't heard the message yet. They haven't heard it correctly. And that's where if you need to use the law, use it lawfully, 
not to set up a standard for them to keep, but rather to show them they've already failed the standard and now God has a new standard. And it's called faith. Amen? Amen. All right, any questions? We have a few minutes. Yes? When it comes to witnessing, I've heard uh, guys that are true evangelists basically say, you know, you need to witness to everything that breathes. And then you have pastors and teachers that say, well, you need to be led by the spirit of who you witness to. Is there a balance in that or... Okay, the question is, some would say that you need to witness to everyone who breathes, and others would say you need to be led by the Spirit, which is right, both. So, uh, it probably depends on your calling, your particular gifting. Uh, The evangelistic gift is going to go after everybody. That's just their their bent, their gift, their nature. Uh, The pastor-teacher gift is going to be more discipleship-oriented, training people up and witnessing that way. Uh, many, I am not the evangelist bent at all, but many, many, many people have gotten saved under, under my ministry by coming to hear a word. And so it, it all works. You know, I don't get condemned because I'm not an evangelist, and I hope the evangelist doesn't feel condemned because he's not a teacher. We all need each other. So some are out there witnessing to everybody and sowing those seeds, and maybe weeks, months, or years later, that person would say, you know, I want to hear more about this, and they come to church and they get saved. You know, it, there's just so much variety, so I wouldn't pick one over the other. Okay, someone else? Scanning the room here. Come on, guys. All right, go for it. There's a scripture uh, that I don't know in the Old Testament that talks about the, the, blood of the, the blood of the people's on our hands. And I know I've heard some evangelists kind of use that in a guilt way for us to witness to people. Are you familiar with that scripture? Well, you kind of loosely translated it, yeah. Uh, Okay, basically the, the concept here is that we're, we are under a, a guilt cloud if we're not witnessing. Um, I wouldn't take the guilt because I believe my life is a living witness. And so I, li- I, I am of the be led of the spirit camp more than the evangelist might be of the everybody that breathes camp. They sometimes look down on my camp uh, I hopefully have grown to where I don't take offense at that. I recognize the different giftings in the body. I don't receive guilt from anybody about anything. That's, there's no way to live there. So um, we, I, I would say this. We are responsible for our generation. We need to be involved somehow. We're either goers or we're senders. We're intercessors. We have to live the message. But, but we should be doing something to reach our generation, but not with guilt. That, that's not the way to do it. Okay, someone else? Yes. So, uh, is the law only lawfully used when the person's conscience is sheared, or is it something that you can use regularly in a witnessing form? Well, some people, Hebrews 3, 13, and 14, the question is, can it only be used if their conscience is seared? Uh, Hebrews 3, 13, and 14 is a warning against the, the deceitfulness of sin, and of the heart become, becoming hardened. So you can actually use the law even with Christians, as long as you're not establishing it as their standard of righteousness, but rather using it to say, look, I think you've become hardened in this area. You know, and I, it says exhort one another daily while it's still today, lest you become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So I think there's a place for it even in the church, as long as it doesn't become your standard. Does 